time let's clap our hands unto the Lord why don't we praise him right now because he's worthy oh we need you today Jesus thank you Lord for all that you've done we bless your holy name you're worthy Jesus praise him hallelujah hallelujah so good to see everyone here this morning I'm glad that you are here worshiping with us at Life Restoration. If you are a guest this morning, this hand clap is for you. We're glad you could come and be a part today. We want to invite you back. We want you to visit as often as you can because there's always something going on at LRC. You can't afford to miss one service because if you do, you'll miss something. Praise God. Hallelujah. So I know... We're kind of running the skeleton crew. This is Labor Day weekend. In case you didn't notice, you most likely have the day off tomorrow, hopefully. Amen, amen. So better than that, it ushers in fall, and I am ready for some fall. No more of this 90-degree nonsense. Praise, and I don't have to mow my yard. That's a plus. Hallelujah. So... Oh, before we get started, uh, quick announcement, September 28th, that is next month, uh, BOC, uh, this month, it's already September, it is, uh, September 28th, that is a Saturday, uh, we will be having BOC, they uh, are a praise and worship team that will come in, this is going to be a Saturday afternoon, 4 o'clock, and uh, we want you to be here, invite someone, they are incredible musicians, singers, very anointed, very talented. Uh, they will be here, and we were going to have some Saturday church, and it's going to be great. 
And then on Sunday, September 29th, Cedric and Nicole White, they will be here. Uh, they will be singing. They are the leaders of BOC. They will be here singing. And then they will also, uh, Brother Cedric will be bringing the word. So mark those two dates on your calendars. We want you to be here. You will get something from them. And we will get in and see what God wants to do. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. So, Jeremiah 29, starting at verse number 11. This was on my heart this morning, so I hope it speaks to someone today. It says, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity to give you a future and a hope. You have a future and a hope in Jesus today. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. God hears your prayer. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. See, when I come into the presence of God, I don't want to just go through the motions of it all. Instead, I want to come into His presence with a need in my life and say, Lord, I'm giving it to you 100% today. I cannot fix this. There is nothing that I can do to make this right. But if I hand it over to you, I know that you're making a way. I know that you're keeping it in the palm of your hand. Now, do you believe that this morning? Do you know that God is a healer and a way maker? Praise God. Hallelujah. So I want to go before the Lord in a time of prayer right now. If you have a need, we can make it known by the lifting of our hands. God knows and He sees every need. Nothing is beyond His power. But we could go to Him with our other hand lifted up in prayer and say, Lord, we're coming to You right now. I pray, Lord, that You would move according to Your will. We thank You for the presence that we feel in this house today. We thank You for the Spirit that is here right now. Lord, we pray that You would move according to Your will. Lord, I pray that Your will would be done. Lord, we thank You, Jesus, for all that You're doing in every situation that was spoken, in every situation where a hand was lifted. You see the need, God, in full detail. And Lord, we know, oh God, that you're bringing us to the other side. For Lord, let us pursue after you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. I pray, Lord, that you would use us, that you would lead us and guide us, that you would give us the strength that we need. We thank you for all that you're going to do. I pray that you would bless the service today, that you would unite us in worship and anoint the pastor as he brings the word this morning. In Jesus' mighty name, and everyone said amen. Worship with the singers as they sing this morning. Better is one day in your courts. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your courts than thousands of away. Better is one day. Better is one day in your courts. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day thousands of swears surrounded by your glory what will my heart be oh will I dance for you Jesus or in all of you be still will I stand in your presence to my knees will I fall will I sing hallelujah Yeah. 
never fails and never gives up and never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up and never runs out on me. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Are you thankful that his love never ends? <laughs> Come on, somebody. Are you thankful that no matter what you've done, no matter where you've gone, no matter how far you've drifted from God, his love is always reaching for you. His love is always there to grab you. Oh, there's nothing like the love of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Bible says that He'll never leave us nor forsake us. That's how far His love goes. I could never... The Bible says that nothing can separate us from the love of God. It doesn't matter what we do. It doesn't matter... How, oh my God, I need somebody to hear me right now. It doesn't matter how bad you mess up. It doesn't matter how bad you fall short. God said, I will love you unconditionally. It is an unconditional love that God has for his children. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Are you happy to be in the house of the Lord today? Amen. God is so good to us. Has it been good to anyone this week? Amen. We serve a mighty God. We serve a great God. Hallelujah. There is no one like our God. He never fails. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. He's with us always. Eve, the Bible says, even unto the ends of the earth, He is with us. Though we make our bed in hell. <laughs> Anybody ever felt like you made your bed in hell? He's still there with you. Always. He is always with you. And I'm so thankful today to know that God is on our side. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, I truly feel the presence of God in this house. And I'm thankful for all that He is doing. I know uh, we have some musicians out of town this week being Labor Day weekend. And so we've got some fill-in musicians and and uh, they hate doing this, but they did great, and I'm so proud of them. They, they did an awesome job. Amen. Amen. God is so faithful to us. Amen. 
I believe I've got a word today, not for just one person or two people, but I, I believe I've got a word for this congregation. And I hate that there are some people out of town because it's Labor Day weekend, but I, I just felt this in my spirit to deliver today. And so I hope that you'll preach with me. Well, I got about five of you. That's all right. If five of you will preach with me, I'll be good. I, I, I want to ask you because I believe in the power of prayer wholeheartedly. I believe prayer is one of the most important and vital things in our life. We have got to pray. We've got to communicate with our Heavenly Father. And so because I believe in the power of prayer, I'm going to ask you as a church, I'm asking you just to lift up your pastor over the next few days this week. Because I've been facing some things over the past three or four weeks that, that has just caused me pain and grief. And I'm distraught. I'm just telling you, I am distraught over what I've been experiencing. And so I'm just asking you to pray for me and my family. Will you do that? Just some things happening around here. I, we're not leaving the church. We're not, we're not, you're stuck with us. Amen. So it's nothing like that, but there's just some situations going on, and I, I am distraught over, and I, I just need your prayers. Just pray specifically for peace in my, in my mind and in my life. That, and I know many of you have already been praying. I, you've told me, and I, and I do appreciate it, but I, I'm just asking as a whole, if you'll just lift myself and my wife and my family up, and then lift this church up. Amen. This church needs your prayers. I'm just going to leave it at that, okay? Amen. In the name of Jesus. I know we've been standing. I know we've been worshiping. And I've, I've got a little bit of a lengthy reading, but if you'll just remain standing with me just for a few more moments, I, I want to read to you um, the scripture that the Lord has placed on, in, in my heart today. I, I've had this scripture and this this thought in my notes for some time now, but it's just not come together for me to be able to preach. Um, but it, it come together this time, and I, and I believe it's because God has ordained it, and I believe God is wanting to speak something into this house here today. If you will just open up your mind, open up your ears, your heart, and receive what thus saith the Lord God Almighty. Amen. If you have your Bibles, if you will turn with me to the book of Acts. I love the book of Acts. Amen. If you're a born-again believer, Jesus Christ, born again of the water and of the Spirit, you should love the book of Acts. Amen. Acts chapter 4. And I'm going to begin reading at verse number 1, and I'll read through verse 20. I know it's a lengthy reading, but, but I need you to get this entire story of what's happening here. Acts chapter 4, and I'll begin reading at verse number 1 out of the King James Version. And the Word of God says, and as they spake unto the people, the priest and the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold unto the next day, for it was now eventide. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed. <laughs> There's something about when the word goes forth that people begin to believe. They heard the word, believed, and the number of men was about 5,000. My God, what a revival. And it came to pass on the morrow that the rulers and elders and scribes, and Inus the, the high priest, and, and Cephas, and John, and Alexander, and as many as were with the kindred of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? <laughs> Woo. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole? 
Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you made whole. I'm not done. But you see, God through the power of the Holy Ghost operated through Peter and John. And they begin to heal people and they cause people to be made whole. Verse 11, this is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's through the name of Jesus Christ. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against him. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves saying, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem and we cannot deny it. <laughs> but that is spread no further among the people. Let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. Now watch this. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Ha 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 ha. I want to preach to you from this thought just for a few moments today. Hallelujah. A case of mistaken identity. A case of mistaken identity. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, for how you're going to speak, how you've already moved in this place. God, I am believing right now for the supernatural. I am believing for miracles, signs, and wonders. God, to begin to unfold in this house even now. God, I am believing greater things that are going to take place in the name of Jesus Christ because there is no greater name. I pray right now, oh God, that you would bind us together. Let our minds and our focus be on you right now. God, help us to hear your word. Help us, oh God, to receive what you're speaking. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, I do pray. Amen. High five your neighbor and tell him in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, you can be seated. Thank you, Jesus. A case of mistaken identity. Certainly the disciples would have been educated as most other Jews were. But the reference to them as ignorant and unlearned indicates that they had been formally trained, that they had not been formally trained in the schools of the rabbis. All they could say was that they had been with Jesus. Their boldness and their teaching and beliefs identified them with their rabbi who was Jesus. Dry and formal religion is ever intolerant of enthusiastic, vital evangelism that produces results in the hearts and lives of people around. All it takes is just a brief moment to hear the Word of God. See, the Word of God can do something in a minute that it would take me a lifetime to accomplish. All it takes is for the Word of God to be heard in the life of every believer. But its leaders were surprised to see that uneducated and untrained men were making an impact on the community while they were all in their wisdom. They failed to rise above the flesh and blood. They were struck by the boldness of Peter and John. Hang with me. We all need a boldness. Oh my God, I pray for a boldness every single day. 
See, they would like to have brushed them aside as uneducated and ignorant fishermen from Galilee. But there was something about their self-control. There was something about their empowered life. There was something that their fearlessness that made them think of Jesus when he was on trial. See, they attributed the boldness of the apostles to the fact that they had been with Jesus. But the real explanation was that they had been with Jesus. But more importantly, now they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. <laughs> See, knowing that Peter and John were unschooled, the, the council was amazed at what was being, had been done in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. You see, a changed life convinces people of the power of the name of Jesus. See, one of your greatest testimonies is the difference that others see in your life and the attitude that changes since you have believed in Jesus and since you have been filled with the Spirit of God. <sighs> see, once you've been filled with the Spirit of God, your attitude should change. Your mentality, the way you think, should change. If it doesn't, I would question if you've truly been filled with the power and the Spirit of God. But Peter and John were not scholars. They, uh, they, they were not ordained teachers. They were working men without a higher education. And so the educated members of the Jewish high council were treated as authorities on the scriptures and the matters of religion. So it amazed them to see uneducated men speaking with such boldness. Oh, hallelujah. 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 See, boldness is an important word in the book of Acts, which depicts spirit-inspired courage and confidence to speak in spite of any danger or threat that comes to your life. See, uneducated and common men like Peter and John were not expected to speak so confidently before the Supreme Court of the land. And the two words, they, they don't mean that they were illiterate or that they were unintelligent, but rather that they had not gone through the advanced training of the schools of the rabbi. But they had been with Jesus. <laughs> I need somebody to get that in your spirit. If you could just be with Jesus. See, it is impossible to imagine how much the disciples would have learned from spending three years in close association with the Son of God that was living on earth, listening to Him teach and hearing Him pray and watching Him interact with, with the most difficult challenges in life. But they knew Jesus. And in knowing Him, they knew much more than all the learned scribes could be put together. You see, Jesus had handpicked his disciples. I would ask you today if you had a business, what kind of men would you interview and try to employ? If you wanted to be successful, you would go out of your way to find the best persons for the job. The disciples were just an ordinary bunch of guys that you would just come across. Yes, it pleased the Lord who knew all men to pick these disciples. They were deliberately handpicked. They did not look like world conquerors. I, I need you to understand that. They were fishermen. They were tax collectors. They were just ordinary people. They didn't look like world, co world conquerors. They, they didn't look like anything. They were constantly arguing. Get this. They were constantly arguing over who would be the greatest in the kingdom. They would sleep when they were told to pray. That's not very godly. One even denied knowing Jesus. They doubted the word of his resurrection. They were far from perfect. But yet Jesus chose them. You want to know why? Because Jesus was planning on starting a world-shaking mission and revival with these very men. They were a bunch of men who had no idea what to do, but yet they kept 
getting it wrong time and time again. But the Lord was patient and the Lord was forgiving and loving them all, all of the time. See, these disciples were always thinking in fleshly and earthly terms. And Jesus delighted in demonstrating the unlimited resources that he had. They thought they were going to their death when Jesus decided to visit Lazarus. But instead he took them to a resurrection party. Peter toiled all night and caught nothing. And Jesus said, launch into the deep and let down your nets. Against all odds and against all natural laws, he showed them how to really fish. See, they, they were worried about taxes, and Jesus literally fished it out for them. <laughs> See, their physical limitations cried out at the life-threatening storm. But he showed them that he was the master of the wind and the waves. You know why? Because Jesus' resources are unlimited. He was connected. See, the disciples knew in their mind that all they had to do was have a connection with Jesus. He was the Holy Spirit. It was the Holy Spirit that made a difference in the disciples' lives. And the Holy Spirit had come and empowered them. And they suddenly realized that it was not about them. It wasn't about what they could do. But it was about Jesus and Him only. He told the disciples that they were to do the work based on His power and based on His resources. Preach the gospel. Heal the sick. Cast out devils by his authority. It's not by your own strength, but it's by his spirit, saith the Lord God of hosts. I need somebody to hear me right now. Jesus said, go and wait for the Holy Ghost until you be endued with power from on high. He said, go and wait for the power. If you don't know by now, that is our connection to Jesus Christ is the power and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. This is what we've got to continually remember. We have to remind ourselves day in and day out that it is never about our ability. It's not about, oh my God, the church that we go to. See, the church is not managed by the methods of the world. Halalamokura. So when you and I say that we can't do this or we can't do that with references to the work of God, what we're actually saying is that it's all about me and it has nothing to do with Him. What we're saying is it's about what I can do. And we're limiting ourselves to our abilities and our resources. Uh, However... When we look beyond ourselves. When we look beyond what we can do. And we begin to look to God. And we begin to look at His resources. And the Bible says He owns a cattle on a thousand hills. Which He has made available to us. Then there is nothing. Hear me right now. There is nothing that is impossible. You see, a beautiful thing happens when we recognize and accept our human limitations for what they are and begin to instead trust in the strength and the power of our God. We realize that it's no longer up to us. It's no longer up to our limited resources. We're no longer looking to ourselves for what we can do. But we are looking to God who... The Bible says who is able to supply and equip us for whatever he's called us to do. See, we will stop retreating into a corner of self-defeat by saying I can't do that because it is no longer about us. But it's all about him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works inside of you. 
in those moments you're able to step out knowing that he who called us is able to supply and equip and we are drawing in his unlimited resources. Uh, you see, many times we're so anxious and we worry and we fret and we're so stressed because we're struggling on our own. We simply, oh, hear me, you ready? We simply pay lip service to the might on God's Sundays. Then we move back into our tiny, struggling life. Oh, it's easy to give God lip service on Sunday when everybody else is worshiping, when everybody else is doing it all. But when you get by yourself in that lonely place, in the darkest moment of your life, then you understand who God really is. See, the problem is, is that we've made it all about us. We've wrapped ourselves layer by layer into cocoons of our own unbelief and our own cynicism. And as each layer is hardened, we have slowly but surely become limited by the resulting shell. But some of us are so masked and shriveled up and we're dried up in our own selfish shell that any motion is difficult, if not impossible. We have limited ourselves severely by thinking that it's all about us and it's all about our efforts and it's all about our resources. But I've come to tell you today that it's not. We fail to take into account that whatever He commissions, He will empower and supply according to His riches. It's not all about you, it's not about your abilities. It's not about your skills or your talents. It's not about your resources. But I've come to tell you that it's about His power. It's about His supply. It's about His enablement to make it happen in your life. See, God never goes back on His promises. The Word of God is forever settled in heaven. For God's promises are yes and amen. You see, outside of Jesus, we're struggling alone with inadequate resources, with limited supplies, with, with our frailty and weakness, regardless of how impressive it may seem in the eyes of man. You see, if the ministry and the labor does not point to Jesus continually, it doesn't count. If it doesn't point to Jesus then we labor in vain. We beat the air. We're wasting our efforts. And we are exhausted for no reasonable service. See, the Bible says that His strength is made perfect in our weakness. Jesus said that nothing shall be impossible through Him. That means when we are depending on Him, then anything can happen. Some of you have been struggling with things in your life for months and years and I've come to declare to you today that it's over. I've come to tell them. If you depend on God and Him alone, then I've come to tell you that anything is possible in your life. When you worry and when you stress, it's because you're thinking from a selfish and limited perspective. But if... But if you leave it in the hands of God, if you put it in the hands of God and leave it there, then I'm telling you, there is nothing that you've got to worry about. See, God is neither careless or indifferent from seemingly impossible odds. The disciples rose to become a force to be reckoned with. They created waves wherever they went because they were not depending on their frail and limited resources. They were able to accomplish the impossible. 
They were able to lay the hands on the sick and they recovered in the name of Jesus Christ. They were able to lay their hands on the blind and they recovered their sight. They were able to lay their hands on the deaf and the mute and they were able to recover their hearing and their speech. You see, there is nothing that is too hard for God when God begins to move through you and in you. You see, what had once appeared as mission impossible actually became mission accomplished. For in His name, they turned the world upside down, or should I say, right side up. We're already living in an upside down world where good is called bad and bad is called good. And we've got to recognize and understand that God has given you the power and the authority. Hallelujah. My God, I'm trying. I'm trying to need y'all to get with me right now. See, once what had once appeared as mission impossible has now been mission accomplished. For in his name, they made the world right side up on their own. The branches of the vine will wither and dry without producing anything. But it is when they are connected to the vine. I need you to hear me right now. I said when it's connected to the vine, then it begins to draw substance and it begins to produce the fruit. My God, what do you say? Pastor, what I'm trying to get across to you today is that if we are not careful, we will have a case of mistaken identity on our hands. People who draw close to me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Listen, you may not be the sharpest pencil in the box. You may not be the sharpest tool in the shed, but you've just got to be willing to be used. And if you're willing to be used, then I can tell you that God will transform your life. God will transform your ministry. God... God would do things in your life that you thought were unimaginable. God would begin to move and operate through you. God wants to transform your life. He wants you to be different so that you can make a difference. God deserves your first and your best, not your last and your worst. We're not serving a leftover God. God does not want your leftovers. But God wants you to give him everything that he deserves. You see, the world will tell you to make time for yourself. Please don't misconstrue what I'm saying. You've got to make time for yourself. But the world will tell you just to to be all about yourself. But the Bible tells us to make time for God and to make time for others. See, the world we live in is anti-God. And the world we live in is anti-Christian. It's already been said America is no longer a Christian nation. The world that we live in is anti-Bible. What I'm trying to tell you today is don't be someone who never makes a difference. The world will try to convince you to believe in the lie that Jesus is only one of the many possible ways to spiritual truth. And I've come to tell you that's a lie from the pit of hell. Because the Bible says that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Oh, I hope y'all ready because I'm preaching right now. See... Political correctness expects you to believe what you will, but keep your faith to yourself. But God has not called you to be politically correct. God has called you to be biblically correct. 
God has called you to be different. God has called you to speak the truth in love. God has not called you to live in isolation. I taught the other Wednesday night that that's where the, the biggest tactic of the enemy is to try to isolate you. Because if he can isolate you from the people of God, if he can isolate you from the house of God, then he's got you right where he wants you. But God, my God, God did not call you to live in isolation. God hadn't called you to have a pity party all by yourself. If you feel the need to have a pity party, call one of your brothers and sisters. Tell them what you're going through because you know what's going to happen. They're going to say, let's pray. And in that moment, they begin to say, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, then there is nothing that can stop the flow and the moving of God's presence into your life. God has never said that His church should be built, build itself a little spiritual cocoon and hide your little self away. Nowhere in God's Word does it say God's people are to, to build a little cozy comfort zone so that they never venture out beyond that. I'm trying, y'all. We are not called to live in intimidation. We are not called to live like we have no confidence in God. We are not called to be afraid of challenges that we face. We are not called to be worried about change. We are not called to live in fear. We are not called to hide in our comfort zone. We are not called to dumb down or hide the gospel. For the gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if you've never repented of your sins, if you've never been buried with him in baptism, if you've never been filled with the power of the Holy Ghost, then I've come to declare that it is for you today. God has not called us to hide the cross. We're not called to ignore the prompting of the Holy Spirit in our lives. I messed up a few weeks ago. I told y'all, I think a couple of Wednesday nights ago, that a man at work approached me and called me into a manager's office and he just told me, he said, I need you to pray for me. He said, I'm battling depression and I'm battling some things in my life and I just need you to pray. My response was, I will definitely be praying for you. And I did all that entire week. I called his name before God. That God would remove the depression and give him peace of mind and peace that passes all understanding. But then I had to repent. Because in that moment, God gave me the opportunity to lay hands on him right there in that moment. And I didn't seize the opportunity. Because I was living as a case of mistaken identity. Yeah, you're a pastor and you're a Christian. I need you to pray for me. Oh, okay, yeah, we'll pray for you. We'll put you on a prayer. My God, no, I should have stopped what I was doing right then. And I should have laid hands on him and rebuked that depression in his life. You know... My God, and I've replayed that time and time in my mind over and over and over again. And I've had to repent to God because I didn't do what He commissioned me to do. Even though I did pray for Him, I didn't do it in that moment. There has been a case of mistaken identity. The world tries to identify you as dumb. And the world tries to identify you as unlearned. And the world is trying to identify you as insignificant. And the world is trying to identify you as ignorant. But they can't. You know why? Because you have been with Jesus. 
I need you to understand with me for a moment that if you in your life have ever been with Jesus, then there is nothing, nothing. We have been called to be the light to the world. We have been called to share the truth of God's word. We have been called to open up our mouth. God hasn't called you to keep your mouth shut and be silent. But God is calling you to open up your mouth. My God, what would have happened in that moment if I would have laid hands on him? And I would have been the witness that God had called me to be. But I was too worried about what other people may think and what other people may say. To do what God commissioned me to do. We are called to be the salt and light to the world. We are called to share the truth of God's word. We are called to open our mouths. We are called to serve God. And we are called to serve our church. We are called to make a difference. My question to you today is this. Is your life a case of mistaken identity? Are you willing to allow the Holy Ghost in your life to help make a difference? Are you willing to be different? Because in your own strength you can't be different. But with the power of the Holy Ghost, the Bible says we are transformed. We are empowered to make a difference. Ah, my God, are you willing to be different? Are you willing to be transformed for His purpose? Are you willing to be transformed to make a difference? You see, in this place of mistaken identity, the world tries to label us as something that God has not called us to be. But I've come to remind someone today that you have been with Jesus. And when you are with Jesus, anything, anything, is possible. Hear me today. God wants to do amazing things through you and in you. God wants to use you to make a difference in someone's life. Peter and John were both unlearned fishermen. They didn't have much of an education. Especially, uh, they didn't go to the College of Jerusalem. Have a master's degree in theology. They were unlearned fishermen. All they knew how to do was cast nets from their boat and and then maybe hope to get some fish. But then one day, Jesus came walking by and said, Cast your net on the other side of the boat. The Bible says when they obeyed Jesus and they cast their net on the other side of the boat, it says they caught fish in abundance. So much so that the boat began to sink. Pastor, what are you saying? I'm telling you that I'm tired of living in a case of mistaken identity. I am tired of not being the person that God has called me to be. I am tired of not sharing what God has given me to share. I am tired of not testifying of the greatness and the goodness of God. I know I may not be the smartest pencil or the the sharpest tool in the shed. And I know that I I may not have a a theology degree. And I, I may not understand all the scriptures. But one thing that I do know, and that is that I have been with Jesus. (laughs) And when you are with Jesus, anything is possible. 
Come on, don't you try to tell me that God took some ordinary fishermen that didn't know how to do anything but cast their net out of the boat. God said, come and follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Come and follow me and I'll, my God, and I'll produce something inside of you that no man or nothing can take away. I believe today that God is calling this church. Not just this church, but the church. All across the world, all across this nation. I believe that God is calling the apostolic Pentecostal church to stand up and to be identified with Him. God is not calling us to live a life of a case of mistaken identity. That's what the world wants you to believe. That's what the world is trying to speak into your life. That you are a mistaken identity. You say you love Jesus. But you don't go to church. Oh. You say you love Jesus but you never testify of his goodness. You say you love Jesus, but you never say what he's done for you in your life. You, you, oh my God, somebody hear me. I believe that God, we've been casting our net on the same side of the boat for too long. God is calling and commissioning Life Restoration Center to begin to cast your net on the other side of the boat. Hear me. And when you begin to cast your net on the other side of the boat, there's going to be a revival in your life. There's going to be a revival that begins to take place in your life that you're going to bring in an abundance of fish that begins to sink the boat. I'm looking for such a revival in this church that the, that the influx of people begins to drown and sink the ship. Because I'm no longer living a life of mistaken identity. I have come to the purpose that God has called me to do His will and to do His work. See, Peter and John may have not had a further education in their life. But they were smart enough to follow Jesus. When he said, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. You don't have to have much of a formal education. If you're willing to follow Jesus. See, God did a mighty work through them. And the world took notice. Hear me. The world took notice that they had been with Jesus. And when you in your life have truly been with Jesus, I promise you the world begins to take notice. He <laughs> Though I messed up in the moment and I didn't pray for him and lay hands on him in that very moment, he still recognized that in a moment I had been with Jesus. And that's all the world is searching for. That's all that the broken, the hurting communities and society is looking for. They just want to know that has someone been with Jesus. Because when you've been with Jesus, things of His nature begin to rub off on you. When you've been with Jesus, things begin to happen in your life that you can no longer explain. Things begin to take place in your life that you don't even understand. But all that, you can, all that you've got an explanation of is all I can tell you is that I have been with Jesus. You see, God did a mighty work through them. And the world took notice that they had been with Jesus. Let's stand all over this building. 
In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I call a mora, yes, yeah, yeah, la la moko to Roma, yes. I want to simply ask you the question today Does your life as we know it right now speak that you have been with Jesus? If your life doesn't speak that you've been with Jesus, then I would challenge you and I would encourage you to make a declaration today to spend more time with Him. I know Jesus isn't here with us in the physical like He was with the disciples, but you can still spend time with Him through prayer, through reading and studying the Word of God consecration unto him you can do these things and draw nearer to God quit living a life of mistaken identity quit saying that you love Jesus but your actions prove otherwise quit saying that I'm a Christian and I, I, I want to go to heaven when you're not doing what it takes because in those moments you're living a life of a case of mistaken identity. And God has not called you to live a case of mistaken identity. But God has called you to live a life full in Him. The world, hear me. If you don't get anything else. The world needs to know. That you have been with Jesus. Huh. Come on, don't, don't tell me that you're a Christian and that you love Jesus and go to church on Sundays and then, and then go to the restaurant on Sunday afternoon and bless out the waitress because she messed up. Oh, I'm preaching now. Because you're living a life of mistaken identity in that point. Don't say that you love Jesus and that you go to church on Sundays and then get on your job and fuss and cuss and have a negative attitude about everything that's going on around you, even when it's beyond your control. All, you, all they've got to know is that you have been with Jesus. And I promise you that if you ever make up in your mind that I'm not going to live a life of mistaken identity. That my life is going to represent Jesus in every aspect. Everything that I do, everything that I say, it's got to be ordained of God. I, I want the world to know that I've been with Jesus. Come on, every head bowed, every eye closed, all over this house. Nobody looking around. I wonder if I've preached to anybody in this house here today. Anybody in this house today that would lift your hand and say, Pastor, I've, I've messed up. I, I, I've made some mistakes in my life. And there, there's been some times in my life that I know God spoke to me to do some things and I didn't do it. Ha. Hands being raised all over this building. Maybe some hands that will be raised and say, Pastor, I, I've been, been living a life of mistaken identity. But from this moment on, from this very moment, I, I want the world to know that I've been with Jesus. 
I can no longer live a life of mistaken identity. But I need the world to know that I've been with Jesus. I need the world to know that He's my everything. I need the world to know that my hope and my joy and my strength is found in Jesus Christ. Come on, people of God, there's something stirring in this house right now. Come on, God wants to give you a revival in your life. God wants to give you a revival in your family. God wants to give you a revival on your job and in your schools. There is nothing that is too hard for God. All you've got to do is say, God, I'm willing for you to use me. God, I'm willing for you just to operate through me. In the name of Jesus Christ. Come on. Some of you have been battling fear. Some of you have been battling uh, doubt in your life. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke that fear. I rebuke that doubt. It has no power. It has no authority. And I declare right now, under the unction of the Holy Ghost, uh, that the world know that I have been with Jesus. Come on. My God, I wish everybody would run down to this altar right now. Come on. If that's your prayer, if that's your desire, that you want the world to know that you have been with Jesus, will you make your way down to this altar? We want to pray with you.